give away and sell everything you have, take a big step of faith, do something crazy. How hard it seemed, how impossible it seemed, yet by doing it, God has brought us to a place that is so much deeper that walking with God, walking with the Spirit of God, is the way that we were created to live. We have the opportunity to receive God's word from faithful servants because I believe it's not about the messenger, it's about the message. Paul reminds us that being literally on the edge, where we are completely beyond our own capacity, can make us feel most truly alive and most connected to God's heart. Morning by morning, you go before me. How do we feel when God asks us to do something risky? Do we like our comforts, our routines, or even our culture too much to say yes to God? The Word of God guides us, encourages us, and challenges us, no matter who brings it into our lives. This week, we begin a guest series, bringing us inspiring messages from speakers from around the world who have followed God's call. This is Living Truth. When we study the scriptures, we see that God speaks through a variety of instruments. Even the Bible itself was authored by him, but through his servants who lived at separate times and various locations. God's voice is the common thread, but it is heard through a multitude of speakers. I've invited a number of Living Truth friends to come and share the gospel. And in the next couple weeks, we have the opportunity to receive God's word from faithful servants because I believe it's not about the messenger, it's about the message. Paul Richardson is the International Director of Mustard Seed. He is an author and missionary living in Java, Indonesia, and a friend of Living Truth. I trust that his message will both challenge and inspire us to embrace God's purpose in our lives. Thank you for that warm welcome. Just to help you understand where I'm coming from in my own background, I myself am an MK. My parents went in 1962 to the island of Irian Jaya, now called Papua, uh, an island of tribal people. And I was born there in a village. I grew up running around with my tribe barefoot, never owned shoes as a child, went hunting and fishing with my friends, and lived in a hut, if you can believe that. Some people find that hard to imagine that someone that looks like me would be raised that way. But that's where I was raised. And I recall as a little boy growing up, uh, there was a lot of ministry and work going on with our tribe. My mother was a registered nurse, and every day she would go out and open up her clinic and people would come in from various villages and various tribes for help, uh, and she would pray with them, and she would um, help them. She would provide medicine for them, and my father worked in discipling young men, and as a Bible translator, he translated the New Testament into the Sawi tribal language. But things weren't always uh, that bright and uh, successful, you might say, because when they first arrived, these people were headhunters and cannibals. And you might imagine the kind of faith and courage it took for my parents to leave Canada and to go to a place like that. They went to perhaps one of the most remote and difficult places on the face of the earth, the malaria-filled swamps of tribal New Guinea. And there they settled amongst the tribe and began to learn the language. And uh, my mother asked my dad, she said, honey, would you mind clearing away some of the trees in the jungle around our house so that we could have grass and I could 
feel a little bit more at home here. I would love to plant some flowers here. So my dad happily went outside and he cleared away the jungle and made a nice, big, beautiful yard around our house and planted grass and made it really nice. And my mom planted flowers. And the next thing you know, the warriors decided, hey, that's a great place to have our battles. <laughs> so I remember many times as a little boy, my dad would say, boys, get under the table. And we knew that was our signal. Something was going on outside. And we would rush for the table and surround ourselves with the chairs to protect ourselves just in case an arrow or a spear would come flying through the windows. And then the, the chairs would be our wall of protection. And my dad would run outside and get between the warring factions and try to convince them to make peace. And this problem of our house being used as the place for battle was just one small problem that my parents encountered every day. It was getting more and more dangerous. It was getting more and more discouraging. My father would sit down in the manhouse with the warriors every day, and he would tell them stories of Jesus. And he began from the beginning of the life of Jesus, his birth, and told about his entire life and all of his teachings. And the men in the, and the, the warriors in the manhouse listened intently to every story. And then my father got to the place where Judas, one of the disciples, one of the friends of Jesus, betrayed him. And not only betrayed him, but in a somewhat artistic way, betrayed him with a kiss. And as soon as my father explained this, the warriors erupted in praise and started clapping and cheering and, and hugging each other and saying, Judas, what a hero, what a man, okay? And my dad was baffled by this. How could it be that month after month he was teaching about the hero who is Jesus, but yet when Jesus was betrayed, it was Judas who was seen as the virtuous one. Because incredibly in this culture, they valued treachery. They actually admired people who could convince you that you were friends, but then turn around and stab you in the back. And the person that could do that in the most creative way was seen as a hero in their community. And so my father was increasingly discouraged. And one day he told one of the tribal chiefs, that he was thinking of moving his family and finding a new tribe. And this man named Isai was heartbroken over this news, and he said, well, if that's the case, then don't worry, we'll make peace. My dad said, how do you do that? How is it possible to make peace when treachery is idealized? And the man said, don't worry, You'll see tomorrow morning. So the next day, my parents went outside, and there were the two warring factions who had battled and been killing each other violently. And this same man, who was a very close friend of my father, went over to his wife. She knew what was about to happen. She didn't want it to happen. She was pleading and crying and screaming out, don't do this. But he still went over to her, and he took her little baby son out of her arms, tore the little boy out of her arms, and went over to the enemy war chief, and he gave his son to his enemy to be raised as the son in another family. And then he walked back empty-handed. And my dad said, what just happened? And some young man standing by said, well, that's a peace child. In our culture, when there's war, there's only one way to make true peace, and that is if you give your son to your enemy. And my father thought, well, that sounds awfully familiar. And so the next day when he went back to talk to his friends in the manhouse, he explained, this Jesus that I've been telling you about is God's peace child given to us. And if we receive him by faith, 
then this is our way of making peace with God. And this key that God had planted within this culture became uh, the opening and the gospel moved into people's hearts and suddenly everything made sense to them. And so later when my dad explained that Jesus was God's peace child, then they said, well, why didn't you tell us? We would never have cheered for Judas if we had known that Jesus was a peace child. And so to this day, more than 50 years later, the Sawi tribe is, for the most part, the majority of people worshiping God and living for God, and God's peace reigns over those people. In my own work, I have the opportunity to go back there every few years and visit and to see how the fruit of my parents' ministry still is lasting generation after generation. And when I was 31 years old, God spoke to me and to my wife, Cindy, and said, it's time for you to leave here and to move out. And we said, where? God just said, whoever recruits you first, just say yes. So someone emailed and said, would you be willing to come to East Java? And we said, yes. And a year later, we were on the airplane. And we've been now closing in on 18 years and having seen miracle after miracle, having seen numerous Christian schools and children's homes and youth centers and other projects that God has opened the door to open to be a blessing to up to 3,000 children and their families. And so we praise God for what he has done. And this whole trip for me has just been one expression after another, saying glory to God and thanks for what he has done through our simple ministry and through the help of an incredible small foundation called Mustard Seed based right here in Toronto. Now, a few years ago, uh, I got an email from the state of Indiana, and this email said, hey, we want to do a mission trip and come visit you and do some work. Uh, we're a group of men, and we're pretty tough guys. We can go just about anywhere, and we want a challenge. So what do you think? And immediately I thought about the Miratus Mountains, a mountain range on the island of Kalimantan, right across the equator, one of the hottest, most humid places on the face of the planet, and this remote place deep in the jungle held several villages of which had never heard the gospel, let alone had any contact with the outside world, save one anthropologist who went to live there in the 1960s and lived there for six months and lived to, to write about it for her doctoral thesis. That was the only person. So uh, some of my Indonesian friends were saying, hey, let's go up to these villages and there is a group of 20 people who have leprosy. Is it possible to bring medicine? I did some research and found out that leprosy can be cured. There's a tablet that a person can take every day for a year, and they cannot miss a day, and they can be cured of leprosy. And so I realized that this group of men coming out had a doctor that was planning to come as well, so I told him about these villages, but I said, it's gonna be a really hard trek. We're gonna need to bring backpacks, pack food for a week, and be ready to trek through the mud and the jungle to reach these people. And I got an email right back and said, that's just the kind of trip we want. So they packed up all their gear and their you know, technology. There were things they brought I'd never seen before you know, amazing water purification things that they could dip in dirty water and it would be immediately clean and all these things they brought with them and they were just loaded up. We went to Kalimantan, we got into a Jeep, we drove eight hours across the roughest road that you could possibly imagine. One guy said, I've seen roads with potholes, but this is the only day I've driven across roads with potholes inside of potholes because we were... We were being thrown around in the Jeep for eight hours all day, stayed on the floor of one of our children's homes that night, enjoyed the fellowship there. 
Early the next morning, drove eight more hours deeper into the jungle, and there we got out, spent the night on the floor at another village, and early in the morning, shouldered our backpacks and finally struck out into the jungle. Not 10 minutes into our walk, we came to a river. Well, there was no bridge. And our three guides were walking right into the river. So we all stopped and took off our shoes and rolled up our pants. Now, there were some pretty big guys. There was a, uh, a soldier, a guy a re retired from uh, special forces in the United States military, and another guy, six foot five. All right, we all took off our shoes and started walking into this river, only to find that it was covered on the bottom with millions of sharp rocks. So here we are, 10 minutes into our hike, and all these big, strong guys just going, ooh, ah, 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 we can hardly make it across this river. So our little Dayak tribal guides, they came back, and they were about half the size of us, maybe a third of our weight, and they picked us up and carried us out of that river. And I could see on their faces, what have we gotten into here? <laughs> well, we put our shoes back on and started walking through the jungle. And then I hear someone up ahead of me say, oh, no, what's this? And he pulled up his pant leg, and I noticed it immediately. A leech had jumped off of a branch and had gotten onto his skin, and as leeches do, searched for a blood vessel sucked in and then started blowing up with the person's blood like a cucumber. And of course, uh, being in a good mood still, and I said, cool, congratulations, you're the first one with the leech, yes! And everybody started high-fiving him, and we were just having a time of our lives. And then after each of us had had more than 20 leeches, just crawling all over us. We stopped counting. In fact, by the end of that day, we stopped pulling the leeches off. That night, I took my shoes off, and my feet were covered in blood, and I took my, uh, my shoes, and I just dumped out the blood from my shoes, you know, because we had been walking all day with leeches coming onto us. Well, we started climbing up into the mountains, and the trail took us up cliffs. We were climbing vines and trees, and it was slippery and muddy. And then it started raining. And then somewhere around noon, one of the guys asked the inevitable question, how much further? <laughs> so I said to the guy, hey, Brapa Jamlagi. He turned around and said, Satu Jamlagi. And I said, guys! Good news, only one more hour. Everybody said, oh, thank God. And then three hours later, <laughs> there we are, still walking through the jungle. And the guy said, he said one more hour. It's been three hours. How much longer? He turned around and said, one more hour. And then I realized he's not wearing a watch. He doesn't even know what an hour is. He just uses the sun. As his time, right? Well, those days were the hardest days that our little group had ever experienced. There was pain. There was suffering. There was despondency. I remember thinking, if I had cell phone coverage, I would call for a helicopter, and if I had to pay $10,000 to get out of here. I don't have that much money. But if I had to, I would borrow it to get out of here because I hate this. All right. And at one point, late in the afternoon, we hadn't seen anybody all day. And then this guy who's a U.S. Army Ranger, he had read the story of headhunters and cannibals on the airplane on the way to Indonesia. And of course, this was filling his imagination. And suddenly, it just got the most of him. And he said, there's no villages out here. They're taking us out here to kill us and eat us. And I went over to him, shook him by the shoulder. Sean, don't worry. Keep it together, man. There's a village out there. Trust me. All right. And we kept going. Several hours into the night, we arrived in the first village. 
And it was in that village outside, a 10-minute walk from the village where the people with leprosy lived. They had become outcasts. They were no longer welcome in the village. They were no longer allowed to be touched or even to be together with their families. And our group went out and walked along that little trail and found where those people with leprosy were and went right into their midst and just, God just poured out his love in us. We just started hugging them and just pouring out God's love. God just filled us with compassion for these people, for what they were experiencing. And we had the opportunity through the translators to explain to them that there is medicine which can heal them from leprosy. And if they would take these tablets for one year and we taught them how to do that, we shared the gospel with them. The whole village gathered around. It was an incredible memory that was there. And then we did the same in two other villages. As we were hiking out from those mountains, we had to cross one last peak. And the doctor, who was in his 60s, had just had enough. He just said, I can't make it even one more step, guys. And for hour after hour, we had been saying, you know, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And then we would walk another 10 steps. And then someone else would say a Bible verse. And that would just energize us to walk 10 more steps and climbing up this mountain. But finally, Dr. Chatham had had enough. And I'll never forget it. He laid down on a rock. And he closed his eyes and he said, guys, Please tell my wife that I love her. He started, he started tearing up. Please tell my daughter I'm sorry I wasn't a very good father. I don't mean to make fun of him because he's fine now, okay? Uh, but he said, guys, I'm just going to die right here. You guys keep going. <laughs> and, of course, we surrounded him. We said, Dr. Chatham, there's no way we would leave you here. Even if we have to carry you off this mountain, you know, we'll do that. Well, we did get off that mountain and go back the 16 hours back across that road. And we ended up at the Banjar Masin Airport. And there we saw a little refrigerator with ice cold Cokes for sale, and we bought the Cokes and cracked them open and sat around a little table enjoying those cold drinks. And I asked the question, guys, if you could go back a week in a time machine and you had to go through all of this again, would you do it? And everybody got really quiet because we all knew we'd just been through the hardest thing of our lives. And one by one, each one of us said, we wouldn't trade this experience for all the money in the world. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. How is it that after going through torturous pain, we would say unanimously that we wouldn't trade that experience for anything, that what we had just experienced was worth more than gold, worth more than anything, and what we shared together was a memory that we would take with us for the rest of our lives. And it's in this quandary Right? It's in this mystery that as we grow older, we discover, as we look back on our lives, that it's when life wasn't easy. It's when we had to face the greatest challenges. It's when we had to overcome the obstacles, the criticism, the illness, the pain. It was in those moments when we could not handle it anymore and we could do nothing but fall to our knees and cry out to God and ask him, God, please help me. And he did. He came and he walked with us through those experiences and all of us who are growing older, by the way, that means everybody. 
we all look back and we say, those were our finest moments. Those were the moments when I was truly alive. And yet we live in a culture. We live in a time, in a society which teaches us and feeds us a very, very different message about the meaning of life and what makes life worthwhile. We are told through thousands of messages, through media, through what our society values, that personal safety, personal comfort, and personal ease are the places where we want to be. That's the situation that we want to end up in. And those are the destinations in which our decisions guide us towards. And so we navigate through life seeking to avoid challenges, avoid hardship, and find the places of comfort and ease, entertainment. Being fully guided as if we ourselves were at the center of the universe and that God has created us to live for nothing more than to satisfy ourselves with the riches of this world, with the comfort and ease that this world has to offer, and all the while cutting ourselves off from the lives that God has created and called all of us to live. I want to ask if you would, if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 11, Just a little background here. This is a passage, a conversation, so to speak, a communication between Jesus and his distant relative, John the Baptist. Remember that the mother of Jesus and the mother of John the Baptist were together during their pregnancies. And so it would not be a stretch of imagination to say that Jesus and John knew each other since they were little boys. Probably they didn't live in the same town, but they would have seen each other quite often, especially when Jesus' family came south from Nazareth on an annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And so you have Jesus and John, who are maybe second cousins or third cousins, and they're growing up, and they're beginning to have this growing identity realizing that God has created them differently. And so they begin to dream and talk. And Can you imagine these two little boys sitting out in the countryside on a rock and talking about God's kingdom and John talking about repentance? And these things would come to fruition much later. And of course, John would come first. His ministry exploded He was a radical prophet, a truth teller. He wore a camel skin and lived out in the desert in caves. And people would come to the Jordan River to repent and to be baptized by John. And there came a point in John's life when he said in John chapter 3, verse 30, he must increase and I must decrease. And John's ministry did decrease from that point forward, and Jesus' ministry then is the one that exploded. And to make matters even harder for John, he offended someone in a position of power. He offended a king, and this king was enraged that John would tell the truth and speak prophetically about the king. And so John was arrested and thrown into a dungeon. And here he was, rotting away in the darkness, cramped in this little cell, perhaps having visitors that would come and talk to him underneath the crack in the door. And John was growing despondent, lonely, wondering if this was it. Was this going to be the end? And so at this moment, when John was at his lowest, he began to doubt. 
he began to doubt. And I wonder, for many of us, including myself, it has been in our lowest moments that we've been tempted to doubt. It's been in those times when we've prayed and asked God, would you please heal my child? And God doesn't do it. There have been times when we've asked God or felt lonely, God, come and please help me, and we hear nothing, only silence, and we begin to wonder, is God even real? If he is, does he even know my name? Does he care about me? And even John the Baptist had his moment of doubt, and so he sent his disciples to Jesus to ask him this question. Are you really the one? Are you really the Messiah? Or should we be waiting for someone else? This is in Matthew chapter 11. Now, imagine in that moment what you would have said. Imagine that you had the power that Jesus had. I would think that Jesus, at least he would say, Tell John how sorry I am for him. At most, Jesus would say, tell John I'm coming to get him out because every movie has a happy ending. The hero always smiles and laughs at the end of a great movie. But no. In fact, Jesus' response even feels a little bit cold because he just simply says, Tell John what you see. Report to him what you see. Go back and report to John, verse 4. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. When I first was studying this, it just didn't feel right. But as I prayed through Jesus' words, slowly, my eyes were opened to what was really going on. Jesus, who could see the big picture, Jesus, who understood that in a matter of days, John would be executed, and he would be set free. That John would be in an unspeakably better place very soon. And Jesus knew that he himself had his eyes set to the cross. And he was not going to look left or to the right but that he was going to walk into his own death and surrender himself to the cross. And that beating in Jesus' heart was a passionate love for them. Them. Who is them? He said, tell John what you see, that these people who are suffering the blind can see, and Jesus was just alive, and he wanted John, even in his situation, to reorient himself, to open his eyes and to be awakened to something that was greater than himself, to reorient himself even to God's kingdom and God's purposes and God's heart and God's love for the people around. And so Jesus says, report to John what you see, that people with leprosy are being healed, and the blind and the poor are hearing the gospel. They are being reached. God is reaching them. They are being blessed. And that was what was beating in Jesus' heart. Now, Matthew, as a book, 
is filled with so many outrageous radical teachings. For many of us, it's even hard to open and read through Matthew because they're so confrontational. Try it. It's very hard to read Matthew with brutal honesty and to see what Jesus is really calling us to and then to compare that with our lives and with our religion as we experience it today. In another place in Matthew, Jesus said, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. I want to just ask you a question today. Who is they in your life? Eighteen years ago, God called Cindy and me, and our little Katie was two. They was in another country. It meant getting on a 747 jet and flying to another country. It meant giving away or selling everything we owned and going to Indonesia. Because God's call to us, the they, was over there. But I would acknowledge that that's not the norm. But for all of us, there is a they. There are people around us somewhere, whether it's in the office, in the community, whether it's refugees who are coming here to Toronto. There are people out there that they, and if we are connected with God's heart, if we are awakened by God's spirit, if we are moved by what God sees, what God feels, what God wants from us, then we are asked to find the courage to reorient our lives from ourselves, where ourselves are the center of our own little universes. And to have the courage to take the step of faith, to orient, meaning at the center, the most important thing, that the center of our energy, our prayer, our desires, our dreams would be outside of ourselves. And I can testify to you that for me and for my family, when we made this decision to reorient ourselves to children in Indonesia, it changed everything. We wouldn't want to look back. We don't miss the past. I'll share with you a personal story is that many years ago, Cindy had a miscarriage. Uh, we already had three, and I remember people telling us, well, it's not that big of a deal. Praise God, you already have three. But it was incredibly painful. I mean, we'd already started dreaming about names and imagining life with a new little child. And in the midst of that morning, God spoke to me. I'll never forget it. He gave me a promise. God said to me, Paul, I took away your child. But I'm going to replace all the love that you would have given to that child with a love for Indonesian children. That you will feel for them. You will live for them. You will give your life for them in the same way that you do for your own child. And that promise that God made to me so long ago has come true. And that we are giving our lives for children in those beautiful islands of Indonesia. And I hope and pray that God never tells us to do anything else because we're having the time of our lives. But I think way back 18 years ago when God said, give away and sell everything you have, take a big step of faith, do something crazy, 
how hard it seemed, how impossible it seemed, yet by doing it, God has brought us to a place that is so much deeper that walking with God, walking with the Spirit of God is the way that we were created to live. But to do this, we have to make a choice. We have to say, am I willing to say no to the things in which I place my hope? Am I willing to give away if God says for me to give away or to abandon, to turn my back on those things which make me so comfortable today? And all I can do today is testify to you that we did it. And I will never regret that decision because our lives that are oriented around God's heart and God's purposes are lives filled with adventure, filled with miracles, filled with evidence of God's work right in front of us every single day. And I could not imagine going back to the other way of life. Years ago, I ventured on a quest to understand faith. Really, I didn't feel like I understood it. I read it. I felt like, what does he mean? Why is this so important to Jesus? Why is this such a central teaching in the Bible? And so I started studying and praying and asking God, open my eyes to help me understand faith. And the results of three years of writing and research and stories and thinking back through my life emerged in a little book called A Certain Risk, Living Your Faith on the Edge. But I'll just tell you one thing. is that God has given me one image. It's a very simple image that I want to leave you with now as I close this talk. And the image is simply the image of a ledge like this. And here is God out in front of me. And here behind me is my comfort and safety. Here is my routines. And because I'm really good at my routines, I don't need God's help to exist back here. And the longer I exist back here, my faith becomes religion. And as we live in religion, it's easier and easier to ask, is God really real? Because we're going through our religious activities without really living by faith, and God is out here, and God says, Paul, step up to the edge. Now, this is especially hard for me because I'm afraid of heights. If I go up to the top of that tower in downtown Toronto, which I have, it terrified me. And they said, just walk across this glass. You can just look down. And no way would anyone ever convince me to step out over that glass. That's how terrified I am of tall places. And if I get close to the window up there, I start feeling dizzy. And so God gave me this image. Step up to the edge. And God is three meters out this way. And God says, Paul. Jump. I'm going to catch you. Jump to your daddy's arms. I'm going to catch you. Just trust me. I'm in control of what happens next. And here I am caught in this crisis. I want to retreat back, but yet I want to trust in God. Retreat, move forward. And I say, one, two, three. Oh, but I can't. It's too scary. But God is calling and so finally, I find the courage to step up to the edge and leap out over the abyss, the chasm, you know, and trust that God would catch me. That, in my understanding, captures faith. Everywhere it's written in the Bible, every single time the word is used, it's talking about this moment when we want to retreat into our way, it's the logical way. It's the way that makes sense. It's the way that everybody is advising us to live. And God says, no, my way is different. Step up to the edge. Take a risk. Jump out. Follow specifically in act of obedience that I'm calling you to. And trust me for what happens next. 
And I believe that God has called, is calling, will call every single person at People's Church to something. It's something different for each of us. But I simply ask you today, in fact, would you close your eyes with me today as I close this talk? In prayer, Lord God, we confess that in so many ways we are taken, we're swept along by the values of the culture around us, which are totally godless and faithless, which are totally oriented around ourselves. They're incredibly egotistical values. They're incredibly self-centered values. And yet, as we age, we increasingly realize that they're totally void of meaning and purpose and value, true value. And so, Lord, today, we just simply ask that you would speak to us again, that you would call us to the edge, that you would give us, each one of us, the specific thing that you call us to do today, that you make that clear to us. May you anoint us. May you breathe on us. May you raise us up from this point forward to commit ourselves to living by faith, regardless of where that leads us, regardless of what you tell us to say or what you call us to do. And I pray that through this, you would change lives and that they would be blessed by your love as a result. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. The stories Paul shared about his experience in Java remind us of what God may require of us in following him. For Paul Richardson, it was to raise a family in a different environment, to learn a different language, and to try to make sense of cultural values in order to explain the gospel in a way that was understood. Paul reminds us that being literally on the edge, where we are completely beyond our own capacity, can make us feel most truly alive and most connected to God's heart. I'd like to personally invite you to join me, along with Charles Price, and the Living Truth family this fall as we experience the lands of the Bible together. Whether you've been wanting to return or this is your first visit, it's always an unforgettable trip where memories last a lifetime. Imagine a journey where the rich history and breathtaking landscapes offer context to both the Old and New Testaments. As a part of Awaken Israel 2018, we'll walk where Jesus walked and visit the sites where key events from scripture took place. We'll enjoy delicious local food, great accommodations, and meaningful fellowship with like-minded travelers. We'll also pause for a two-day spiritual retreat on the Sea of Galilee, where both I and Charles Price will be sharing the gospel. Don't miss out. Join us this November 15th to the 25th for Awaken Israel 2018. Awaken in Israel. Imagine your journey. Immerse your senses. Ignite your faith. Awaken Israel 2018 is an exploration of origin and destiny. Imagine your journey. From November 15th to the 25th, 2018, join Brett McBride, Charles Price, and the Living Truth family as we travel to Israel. Immerse your senses. Experience the sights and sounds of the lands of the Bible. During this 10-day adventure, we'll visit the Garden Tomb, Masada, Qumran, Capernaum, as well as other amazing destinations. Ignite your faith through worship, heartfelt fellowship, and clear biblical teaching from Brett McBride. For me, it's just been overwhelming to be here, and I know many of you feel the same. Charles Price. And if you view Living Truth, which is why you came to come on this journey with us, and we're grateful that you did. And special guests. <laughs> During a two-day seaside haven of reflection, If I 
I had one word to describe this trip, I'd say life-changing. We haven't had a single glitch. The, the food is wonderful, and um, all of the accommodations have been really terrific. All wonderful beds and pillows and everything has been great. The cost for this amazing Awaken Israel journey is $49.79. To reserve your spot now, simply visit myawakenjourney.com for details or call 1-877-465-3442. Awaken Israel 2018. It's your time. It can be easy to get too comfortable in our walk with Christ, to be distracted by our own circumstances and somehow miss the thrill of taking a leap of faith and trusting God with our lives. But it's never too late. Jesus is calling us to a deeper, more radical experience of walking with Him. Join us again for more Living Truth. To watch this message again, visit our website, download transcripts, order DVDs and CDs, as well as our daily devotional or sign up for our monthly newsletter. Online, you can sign up for podcasts. You can also join us on Facebook and YouTube. We continue our guest speaker series next week here on Living Truth.
Your generous contributions support the work of Living Truth, the media ministry of the People's Church Toronto. We are committed to the highest level of transparency and accountability. If any approved project target has been met, the remaining contributions will be used where most needed as determined by Living Truth.